It's 1863, and we're in France. It's a few years before Napoleon and his armies get absolutely demolished in a war with Prussia. That's Napoleon III, by the way. Bonaparte's slightly less infamous nephew. Now, having just gone through about 53 revolutions and changes in government, things are actually starting to settle down in France, relatively. And a humble wine grower from the Rhone Valley, let's call him Antoine, grabs his morning coffee and ventures out to check on his vineyards, only to find a very disturbing sight. All of his crops are rotting away, which is pretty bad news, but what Antoine doesn't know is that this is just the beginning of a mysterious, seemingly invisible epidemic that would go on to ravage the French countryside for more than 15 years and alter European wine production forever. Welcome to A Voyage of Being. So what exactly was this pestilence? Where did it come from? And what the heck does America have to do with it? Well, to answer these questions, it might help to go back and set the stage a little bit. The 19th century in Europe and the lead up to it was a tumultuous time period, to put it mildly. It was fraught with rebellions, wars, famines, revolutions, a lot of revolutions actually. In 1848, basically every kingdom and territory in Europe was under siege by those pesky peasants or the intellectual class or both. And so everyone was changing governments faster than hairstyles. By the way, if you're like me and dates are kind of meaningless without some broader context to put them in, join me on this tangent through the 19th century. The mid 19th century is essentially the point Europe starts to transition from a few giant monarchies and kingdoms and religious city-states to more like what we think of Europe today. Well, actually Napoleon got that ball rolling in 1806 when he took out the Holy Roman Empire, but still, by 1870, we have official territories called Italy and Germany. Actually, the Kingdom of Italy and the German Empire. Also, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Basically, all the big players for World War I. And a lot of these places are getting their first taste of democracy, in giant air quotes. And a few even get an actual constitution. I mean, in 1848, seemingly every country in Europe has some form of a rebellion or a full-blown revolution going on. Even in Denmark and Sweden and Switzerland, Poland, Romania, Spain, kind of, Ireland, kind of. You could also say that this time period is when the idea of nationalism started to take hold. I mean, the idea of being an Italian wasn't really a thing until Giuseppe Mazzini started talking about a one free independent nation in 1830. And if you're wondering what's going on in the Americas, well, it's more revolution, war, and general political unrest. Also, the American Civil War kicks off in 1861. Central and South America are getting used to independence from European rule, and it's been a rocky start. Everybody's trying to figure out how to live in a world with globalized trade and explosions in the field of science and philosophy. In Asia, you have continued colonization by all the greedy European powers scrambling to grab a piece of new territory, which means France taking over Vietnam, and uh, you know Americans know how that ended. Also, the Asian monetary system changed forever in the 19th century, meaning we start to see US and European and South America currency showing up at Chinese ports. One result of the incredible flow of capital into China was, of course, the Opium Wars, which kicked off in 1839, highlighting the fact that uh, free trade, which is taken for granted as a good thing by most people today, took about a century of death and destruction to flesh out. So needless to say, things around the world in the 19th century less than chill, which is you know par for the course when it comes to history. Okay, so where was I? Ah, right, wine. Okay, with that out of the way, let's zoom back into our friend Antoine in 1863, France. Now, though it was hard to be pretty much anyone in Europe in 1860 compared to the way we live today, it was also post-industrial revolution, and for the first time in history, there was something called the upper middle class. Ooh, bourgeoisie. 
And what that meant was that more people had more money to spend on wigs and wine parties. And Europeans drank a lot of wine and somebody had to sell it to them. So the 19th century saw a huge boom in the European wine industry, especially in France. And so as rookie wine growers flocked to meet the new demand by the mid 1800s, French wine was humming along. Old Napoleon III opened up the economy to trade. So England was buying loads of wine too. And science was finding its way into wine as well, as researchers all over the world were trading plant varieties like Pokemon cards. Unfortunately though, those boats across the Atlantic didn't only bring plants and goods and people. Something even more sinister was coming along for the ride. Oidium, powdery mildew, the first villain in the story of the collapse of European agriculture. Actually, powdery mildew, that doesn't sound all that bad. You know, ooh, is, is that powdery mildew you're wearing? Sounds kind of nice. Actually, it wasn't nice at all. It was a devastating fungus that attacked every plant from wheat and barley to roses and onions. And of course, grapevines were not immune. This thing stopped 60 years of increasing European wine production dead in its tracks. But it was about to get worse. Just as France was getting this powdery mildew problem under control, a tiny little aphid named Phylloxera was making its debut in Europe. Now that I think about it, maybe it's more of a second leg of a round trip because as everyone knows, if you wanna find a solution to a problem, you gotta start at the source. See. Phylloxera did indeed make its debut in Europe, but it had already been playing sold out shows in America for thousands, if not millions of years under the name Dactylus phyrovitifolia, which you have to admit is a pretty badass name. And while the American varieties had time to evolve resistance to Phylloxera, the European ones did not. And it was only a matter of time before the aphids hitched a ride over the pond and went to work in Europe. They just needed a way to get there fast enough to survive the trip. A steamboat, perhaps? Yep, most historians agree it was actually the steam engine that made it all possible. So we can go ahead and add Thomas Savory, inventor of the first commercial steam engine, to the list of people responsible for literally murdering European wine as we knew it. Dang, technology. Technology. You're kind of like Superman in a way. You go around being all cool, a little sexy, saving people's lives, making leaps and bounds of human imagination, and before you know it, your whole damn city is leveled by a 45 minute punch fest. The point being, science is synonymous with unintended consequences. Speaking of destruction, Phylloxera was taking it to the next level, and they were kind of clever about it. See, a lot of them would feast on the roots of the grapevines for a while, suck some sap, lay some eggs, do some damage to the roots, and then just adios out of there. Now this had a few devious consequences. Now first off, of course, they would kill the plant by leaving the roots no way to replenish themselves. But also the plants wouldn't die off until well after the little lice were gone, which made it very difficult for anyone to agree on what the actual cause of the blight was. Adding years to the devastation, while everyone squabbled over what the problem was. It wasn't until 1869 when everyone was finally able to agree that it was actually phylloxera. Enter Jules Emile Planchon. Now old Jules over here had already basically figured out that the aphids were the likely culprit, but he had trouble getting people to believe him for the reasons I just mentioned. The bugs weren't actually still around when the plants started dying. But that all changed, though, when one wine grower noticed that his plants came back to life after a flood hit his vineyard. So 
Planchon did some experiments to show that it was indeed something attacking the roots, all but proving his theory of the evil little root sucking lice. Actually, am I being too hard on these little guys? I mean, they're just trying to survive, right? They can't help but that they love that sweet, sweet grapevine juice. I don't know. Anyway, by the end of 1869, people had stopped scrambling to figure out what the problem was and started scrambling to find the solution. Flooding out the lice, pretty decent idea, but wasn't gonna cut it because a lot of vineyards were planted on hills. And pesticides weren't really working either. I mean, these little guys were damn near indestructible. And by 1871, this pest was cropping up everywhere around Europe, not to mention Australia too, and California. And by then, it had destroyed 40% of the vineyards in France. That's about 6 million acres. And by the end of the 19th century, it would go on to destroy at least two thirds of all the vineyards in the entirety of Europe. And that's just the bottom end of the estimate. So it was all hands on deck to figure something out before French wine was all but extinct. And wouldn't you know it, the answer was found in the good old Lone Star State. All right, so remember Planchon? You know, he figured out what the problem was. Well, the French government officially puts him on the case. So next thing he does, he calls up his buddy, Charles Valentine Riley, the state entomologist of Missouri. By the way, the idea of a state entomologist is kind of cool. I wonder if that still exists. Anyway, so Planchon calls up his buddy Riley, says, Oh, monsieur, I need some help figuring out this pest problem. And Riley's like, well, I'm currently in the Rocky Mountains studying locusts, and also I'm pretty sure this isn't a telephone in my hand, but let me see what I can do. Actually, Riley was born in England, but it's more fun to give him a southern accent. Okay, so Riley and Planchon go to work on the problem and decide that the best way forward is to take the phylloxera resistant American root stalks and graft them onto the European grape vines. That's right, grafting. So they would essentially jam the roots of the American plant into the European vines and Frankenstein it all together, and it works. I mean, it's, it's slightly more complicated than that, but that's basically the gist of it. By the way, if you're wondering what exactly the American grapes evolved to do, like what actually made them resistant to the phylloxera lice, well, I had the same question, so I looked it up. Essentially, the American varieties evolved to have like a stickier sap that got all wedged up in the mouth of these little lice. And even if they did manage to do any damage to the root, the American varieties had like instant healing potions, so they never lost any HP. Now, this grafting thing had some potential, but the problem was the American roots just were not able to handle the chalky limestone soil found in many parts of France. So... France sends Pierre Viala over to America to see if he can find any grape varieties that can handle the alkaline soil. By the way, there are a couple sources that claim this guy named Leo Lallemont came up with the idea of grafting years before Planchon and Riley and nobody really listened to him. He also tried to claim the reward money offered by France, like 350,000 francs, and France was like, uh, nah. -uh. Now, whether it was because he didn't really have a claim to it or because France was super annoyed with the idea that French grapevines would need American roots to save them, who knows? Either way, Leo fell into obscurity. And some people even went so far as to accuse him of starting the blight in the first place, which is just ludicrous. But, you know, people were desperate for a villain, someone to blame for the destruction of their livelihoods, which unfortunately is a running theme throughout history. Okay, so it's 1887, and Pierre Viala's trucking around America looking for the savior plant, right? And if you want to zoom out a little bit and imagine what America looks like in 1887, this is when industrialization is kicking in full force. Tons of European immigrants flocking into the U.S. Railroads being built like crazy. Factories, mining, 
unions fighting for the eight-hour workday, the abolition of child labor. Nice. Good. Don't need that. Uh, women's suffrage. The conversation about prohibition is just getting started. And keep that in mind, because that'll come up later. Okay, so back to Pierre. So he's looking around for an American grapevine that can handle the French soil. And he gets word of this pretty talented and knowledgeable horticulturist and plant breeder who just so happens to know pretty much everything on the subject of grapevine varieties in America, Thomas Volney Munson. And old Pierre gives him a call and, uh, what, he might have a cell phone by now. Uh, TV? You got any grapevines that grow in chalky soil down there in Texas? Munson's like, well, funny you should ask. Meet me in hill country. By the next year, wine growers all over Europe were starting to graft the American species Vitis Berlandieri and a few others onto everything from Cabernet Sauvignon to Chasselas. And uh, that was it. Boom, problem solved. So long, phylloxera. Uh, yeah, no. See, the whole grafting thing didn't kill off the lice. They're still a threat to this day, actually. I mean, ask Australia why they have super strict quarantine laws on plant and livestock. And so even though this solution allowed people to start growing again, the damage was already done and would continue to be felt all the way up until World War I, as is evidenced by the Champagne Riots of 1910. So, yes, grafting was the way forward, but it was an uphill battle back to normalcy. And technically, the best solution actually turned out to be crossbreeding the American rootstocks with the European ones, but the point still stands. That fancy official French champagne that you drink on the weekends on your private yacht was probably made from grapes with Texas roots. Ha! So much for your fancy, pure French champagne, huh? Now, does that make it any less good? I don't know. That's probably for the experts to decide. All the credible studies I've seen suggest nobody can really tell the difference, but you try convincing the average Frenchman that California champagne is just as good as French champagne. Ah, the French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. Huh, French champagne. Technically, that's a redundant term, isn't it? I mean. If it's champagne, it can only be French, right? That's what all the fun people at parties keep telling me. Well, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. Shall we briefly wrap up by discussing the fascinating topic of trademarks, geographical indications, and intellectual property law? Yes. Technically, according to the rules of appellation, which is basically like intellectual property for food and other cultural stuff, only sparkling wine that is produced in the Champagne wine region of France, with its very strict methods of production, can be labeled Champagne. But then why can I go down to the local liquor store right now and grab a bottle of Andre Extra Dry California Champagne? Well, to answer that, we got to go all the way back to June of 1919 and the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. You guys remember World War I, right? No, not the one where Vin Diesel gets shot in France. The other one, the one before that. Well, it turns out when it was over, all the important mustaches got together to sign this peace agreement called the Treaty of Versailles. It's 1919, World War I is over. Whew, thank God that's in the rearview mirror, guys. Let's never do that again. But we still got to hammer out some details of this, quote, peace. So all the boys are there. George Clemensois from France, David Lloyd George from Britain, Vittorio Orlando from Italy, Herman Mueller from Germany, and Woodrow Wilson for the USA. They're all there to essentially figure out how the world is going to look after the most devastating war in human history. Well, up until, you know, the next one. And of course, none of them can agree on anything other than the fact that Germany should go to their room and have a long time out and think about what they've done. It is interesting to note that the Allied powers continued to blockade Germany even after the war had ended, like through December, while, you know, tens of thousands of Germans essentially starved to death. But we were the good guys. Just, you know, sometimes the heroes of history are a little bit more complicated than we would like to think. For example, if you're a big Winston Churchill fan, do not go Googling his name and the word India. Actually, you know what? No, you should go Google it. Go read up on it and form your own opinion. <laughs> 
So Conference of the Treaty of Versailles, this is an arduous process with lots of complicated details, and they're trying to sort out the picture of post-war Europe. But the part we're interested in is France's desire to make sure that whole champagne thing gets sorted out. Also, right at the start of that great wine blight when phylloxera is really doing some serious damage, the demand for French wine was actually increasing. Remember, it's post-industrial revolution, the growing upper middle class, Napoleon III opening up the country to trade and all that. So uh, the big champagne houses, they start getting real shady in order to meet that growing demand. And some of them begin importing grapes and wine from Germany and Spain and trying to pass that wine off as authentically French. This, of course, meant the big champagne producers weren't sourcing their grapes from the local French wine growers, who basically had no power in this relationship. I mean, who else are they going to sell their grapes to? Couple that with the severe frost and rains and more mold and mildew epidemics and things are starting to get real bad for the little guy in France, which just highlights a fundamental fact of history and society in general. The upper classes are never first to feel the pain when things go south. Hence, the champagne riots I mentioned earlier. So, yeah, people were pissed. They basically just went on a rampage around the Champagne region, destroying trucks that were trying to bring in foreign grapes and wine and literally burning down the villages and homes of the suspected fake Champagne producers. The governor of the Champagne region at the time sent a telegraph to Paris saying, quote, We are in a state of civil war, begging the capital for help. Okay, I'm sorry for going off on another tangent like that, but I just can't help myself. This whole time period in France is just insane, and it just keeps getting more and more insane. Just imagine being a French wine grower in 1911, okay? People all around the world are dying to buy French wine. Demand is booming. There's money to be made, baby. But your crops keep getting pummeled by evil lice and mildew and mold and bad weather. And on top of that, The rich wine producers in the region refuse to buy what little crops you do manage to harvest, choosing instead to outsource to Germany and Spain. Oh, and did I mention the big champagne houses were also colluding to fix prices? Yeah. And right at that moment, when you can't imagine things getting any worse than they already are, the most devastating war in the history of time decides to pop off and basically destroy your entire country. So, in short, uh, things were pretty bad, and there was some cleaning up to do at the Treaty of Versailles, and a big topic of discussion was making sure that there were some rules surrounding the production of traditionally French products like wine and cheese and butter. So, France made sure that Article 274 and 275 were included in the Treaty of Versailles. I'll just uh, give you the highlights here. Article 274 says, Germany undertakes to prohibit the importation, exportation, manufacture, distribution, sale, or offering for sale in its territory of all goods bearing any marks, names, devices, or description whatsoever, which are calculated to convey directly or indirectly a false indication of the origin, type, nature or special characteristics of such goods. AKA wine. And then they go on to hammer that point home in article 275. Okay, man, don't you just love the way lawyers write? It's beautiful. So everybody eventually signs a treaty of Versailles. France goes back home happy. Problem solved, right? Well, no. See, besides having no mustache, Woodrow Wilson had a hard time getting the U.S. Senate to actually vote to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. So, treaty signed, but not ratified, which basically means it didn't exist according to U.S. law. The result of this failure to ratify in the Senate was that the U.S. didn't have to abide by the laws set out in the Treaty of Versailles, including that stuff about champagne. Okay, so... Now you're probably asking, why didn't France do something about this? Weren't they angry that the U.S. wasn't following the treaty? Well, probably, yeah. But what were they going to do about it? They had bigger fish to fry in post-war Europe, and they were actually mostly focused on punishing Germany in the first place. And besides, the U.S. had just banned alcohol. Yep, 
In January of 1919, the U.S. ratified the 18th Amendment. And everybody knew prohibition would totally last forever, so what was there to worry about? Well, fast forward about 50 years and a few more global conflicts, and suddenly every Tom, Dick, and Harry was walking around with a bottle of generic Corbel, Chianti, or Burgundy, or Champagne. And now, France decides that they'd like to revisit that whole sparkling wine issue again. And in 1983, the EU and USA start the conversation. By this time, other industries like sherry producers in Spain and famous American brands like, I don't know, Pepsi or whatever, they're starting to realize maybe they'd like to get in on some of that international trademarks and appellations action. And so they all begin talking. And because these are a bunch of lawyers in smoke-filled rooms, it took them about 20 years to get all the details hammered out. And finally, in 2005, the EU and the US agree on labeling laws for wine that made it illegal to use the word champagne on your sparkling wine unless it was actually produced in Champagne, France. Well, unless you had already been producing these off-brand wines before 2006, in which case you were grandfathered in. Which is why you can go down to the local Jimbo's Fine Wine and Spirits and pick yourself up a nice four-pack of Cook's Brut for $7.99. Now, I'd be willing to bet that most people listening to this are thinking, all this Appalachian origin stuff is kind of ridiculous, you know? You want to make it illegal for me to call my sparkling wine champagne or my ham parma or my agave liquor tequila? just because it wasn't made to the exact standards according to some country I've never been to? Well, try looking at it from the perspective of the original producers of these specialized products. And it may help to consider a different example of geographical or cultural branding. Imagine you are a traditional indigenous artist from Australia, let's say, and one day you're walking around the local markets in Perth and you pass by a carpet shop that's selling carpets with your artwork on it. And not only are they making a business out of people literally trampling on your sacred artwork, but they're selling these things for $4,000 a piece in some cases. And they ain't even giving you or your indigenous community a dime for it. Even worse, they're telling their customers that they are compensating the artists. Well, that is exactly the kind of thing that can and did happen in 1993 to an artist named Banduk Marika and some of her fellow artists and their artwork. Eventually, they got this company, Indofern, to stop reproducing and selling their sacred artwork, but, but that wouldn't have been possible without the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works. So you can start to see how this stuff gets complicated. Now, it may be that some artists, they don't mind people taking and repurposing their work, but it's not hard for most people to understand why these laws need to be in place. And how with a slight tweaking of the story I just mentioned, you could imagine a similar story playing out with traditional forms of music or dance or even food and its method of production. Now, the Berne Convention doesn't deal with food, but the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights does. And without it, the essence of Chilean pisco or Mexican tequila or French champagne might get watered down and even lost in the churn of the modern, unrestricted global marketplace. The truth is, good champagne is hard to make. You know, it's a long, difficult process, and it matters where the grapes came from and how they were harvested and how they do the fermentation process and the blending and the maturation, the aging and all that expertise that's been perfected over centuries through knowledge that passed from generation to generation. It's history. And it's unique to a limited number of communities and regions in the world. And those people deserve the right to make sure the world understands and appreciates that history. And not simply just exploit it. And whether we like it or not, the words we use to describe things have value. And there will never not be grifters out there ready to exploit the history behind a word just by slapping it on their box or bottle. But I also think it's a good thing that wine producers in California, for example, get a chance to pay homage to that history rather than it being locked away by a few gatekeepers. So it's muddy. And the solutions can be difficult when you start to look at each individual case of traditional cultural expression. And if you want to go down that rabbit hole, by all means, become an IP lawyer and dig in. But for the rest of us, 
we'll just, you know, shrug our shoulders and have to be happy with it's complicated. All right, that's it for today's episode. I hope to see you in the next one. If you enjoyed it, feel free to subscribe, comment, share, and look out for more episodes. All right, see ya. By the way, did you know that Chilean wine is actually more French than most French wine? Yeah, the original Bordeaux red grapes, which now have American roots in France, actually still exist in their original pure form, mostly in Chile. Turns out having a giant mountain range in the Pacific Ocean on either side of your country can be a good thing sometimes, you know, it keeps out the pests. Same goes for Southern Australia too, where the pure Bordeaux vines with their own roots still exist. Of course, that's only because Australia has a super strict quarantine system in place to keep out phylloxera. I mean, they did have a problem with it originally. They just managed to, uh, to get rid of it entirely. You know, there's actually...